I was weird when I was in high school. The reason I say that was because non-typically of males, my favorite subject in high school was English. Now, most guys would say that their favorite subject was phys ed or uh, wood shop or study hall or something, lunch maybe, uh, but not English. And even more strange than that, my favorite nine-week segment of the English year was when we did English grammar. I loved grammar. And my favorite activity in grammar was diagramming sentences. How many of you diagram sentences? you remember that? Wasn't it fun? You know, it, it, when you diagram a sentence, you draw this schematic, right, of all these lines, and every word in the sentence has a place on that diagram. There's a place for the subject and for the verb, the direct and indirect object, the prepositional phrases and the predicate nominal, all that stuff. Every, every word had a, uh, was a part of speech and had a place, and you had to diagram the sentence, figure out how it fit and, and how it correctly uh, modified or went along with the rest of the words in the sentence. And to me, that was just a, a challenge and it was something that I enjoyed doing. Sometimes there was a compound subject or a compound object or even a compound verb and those two words were then connected by a dotted line and on that dotted line was placed a little word called a conjunction. And is a conjunction. Or is a conjunction. The word B-U-T is a conjunction. A conjunction is a word that joins two other words or thoughts in comparison or in contrast. The conjunction but has the distinction of changing the direction that a sentence seemed to be going. It would change the outcome of what a sentence began to say. For example, an employer calls a loyal employee into the office and says... We have eliminated your position. But we want to offer you a promotion to a higher salary job. Wow, did you see what happened? That little word, but, was the hinge upon which a door swung open to a brand new future. Here's another example. My girlfriend left me on the same day my dog died. But I wrote a country song about it and made a million (laughs) dollars. That little insignificant word brought a complete change of fortunes for that individual. So for our purposes today, let's call B-U-T the conjunction of reconstruction. Because it changes what was previously said in a sentence to a new and better outcome. No one can change the direction of a bad path to a good one better than God. He is the master of reconstruction. He is superior at providing a new and better outcome for our lives. Therefore, whenever we read the words, but God... In the Bible, they are vitally important to us. But God is our sermon word for today. I know it's two words. I get that. But since I wrote this sermon series, I get to cheat a little bit. And today, instead of just one word, we're going to use two words for our sermon word. In fact, this sermon will conclude our series of studies that we've been doing, Wisdom in a Word. Today, we're going to look at the words, but God, and see how positively they impact our lives. Did you know that that phrase, but God, appears over 45 times in the Bible and it usually introduces a gracious message to us? Those two words capture God's nature for he redeems, he resurrects, he makes all things new. All seems lost. And then we read, But God, and everything changes. That phrase tells us that God intervenes. He salvages. He saves. There was no way, but God made a way. 
Our text for today comes from Matthew, the 19th chapter. We're going to look at the story of the rich young ruler in that chapter. You probably remember that story. A young seeker comes to Jesus asking questions about eternal life. But it's really a story about the struggle that most of us face between the but I life and the but God life. Let's begin to read that story in Matthew 19, beginning in verse 16. A man came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, and we learned last week that that word perfect really means complete, the finished product. If you want to be perfect, if you want to finish product, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. A few verses later, as we will see in a couple of minutes, Jesus dropped that but God phrase into this story. But God teaches us to trust him. For he alone is worthy of our complete faith. The rich young ruler had a but I mentality. But I need to do something to get eternal life, he thought. But I already keep the commandments, he claimed. But I want my possessions, he implied as he walked away from Jesus. Many of us share that but I mentality with him. It used to be suggested that the two most important words in the English language are thank you. Thank you. And rightfully so. Uh, Because they express gratitude towards some act of graciousness, some act of generosity, some goodness that another has given to you. And so it honors them for their goodness. But more recently, new words have been suggested as the two most important words in the English language. According to an article on the website Thrive Global, the two most important words now should be I am. As in, I am beautiful, I am amazing, I am special, I am me. (laughs) Okay. A recent article in the Huff Post stated something similar. It identified the two most important words in the English language as I want. Really? Other articles I have read suggest I can or I will are the two most important words in the English language. Do you notice how the focus has shifted from thanking you to all about me? I am, I will, I can, I want. We are seeing a growing epidemic of egocentricity, looking inward in a self-absorbed way. It is the but I point of view, and it stands in contrast to the but God life. Jesus taught the but God life to this rich young ruler and to us through his story. He seemed to say to that young man, the commandments are good, but God is here. Follow me. He seemed to say, morality is important, but God should be the focus of our attention. He seemed to imply to him, the blessings of life are nice, but God should be our first love. Many of us, like that rich young man, are unable to live the but God life. Because but I gets in the way. I love God, but I don't want a faith that requires full commitment. I love righteousness, but I want to enjoy life too. I love God's church, but 
I have other interests on Sundays. And when those believers are convicted about their worldly pursuits and called to put God and his kingdom first, like the rich young man, many of them walk sadly away. But God teaches us to trust him. He alone is worthy of our complete faith, and he alone gives us hope. Let's read the rest of that story, returning to Matthew 19, picking up where we left off in verse 23. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. But God will positively affect our lives. We read that about the fledgling nation of Israel as they were about to get started In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, when it says, You were the smallest nation on earth, but God loved you and saved you by his great might. We read that in Psalm 73, verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. We read it in a promise given to us in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man, but God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. And then in the first few verses of Ephesians chapter 2, we read, You were dead in trespasses and sins, but God, being rich in mercy, made us alive. It seems that every time we read, but God, in the Bible, good news follows. What a holy conjunction. The conjunction of reconstruction. The pessimists and the cynics and doubters among us will say, yeah, but. And scripture answers powerfully, but God. You see, no matter how terrible our present circumstances, but God teaches us that God writes the ending of our story. And we know our story will will change from bad to better because of but God. Times are uncertain, but God always has a plan. This world is filled with darkness, but God brings light. Antagonism and hatred permeate our nation, but God is love. Fear looms in our hearts, but God gives us courage. Worry keeps us awake at night, but God provides peace. Solutions evade us, but God always has an answer. The future looks dismal, but God brightens our prospects. Injustice and corruption prevail, but God produces righteousness. This world is in such a mess, but God is still in control. We are unsure of the road ahead, but God directs our steps. We feel overwhelmed, but God gives us strength. We struggle in despair, but God gives us hope. But God changes our life for the better. For but God tells us of his intervening power. Let's go back and look at verse 26 again and read the most important statement Jesus made in this story. With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. However, we must allow him to work in order to experience but God in our lives. That was the problem with this rich young ruler. He wanted to do it all by himself and he tried. But he realized that he was unable. What must I do, he asked. What do I yet lack, he asked. And Jesus said, you can't. But God will, if you allow him. 
Jesus said God can even do the impossible. Someone said God takes the I am out of impossible. And without the I am, all we have left is the possible. Only in God. And but God in our lives are all things possible. So we must remove the but I from our vocabulary and live the but God life. That is especially true of our salvation. James Montgomery, Boyce, a Christian writer, said, If you understand the two words, but God, they will save your soul. If you recall them daily and live by them, they will transform your life completely. Bible commentator Martin Lloyd-Jones said those two words contain the whole of the gospel of Christ. They tell us that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how many mistakes you've made, no matter what type of failure you've experienced, there can be a but God moment in your life that will radically change your future. I had a but God revelation when I was 19 years old. I had been raised in the church all of my life. I had memorized a lot of scripture, and I knew more of the Bible than most adults did in our church. I knew the life that Christians are called to, but I was living a but I life, as in, yes, I understand what the Bible says, but I want something different. That was how I was living. And then in the study I was doing, I took a hard look at Hebrews 10.26, which tells us, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no more sacrifice for sins is left. I had not only been sinning willfully, I had been enjoying it. I had continually resisted but God and had lived but I. But I saw my future in that verse. And it wasn't the future I had previously envisioned. The future I had previously envisioned said something like this. When I am old and tired and close to death, I'll repent and slip into heaven just ahead of the undertaker's work. (laughs) But now in that verse, I saw a different future. One that said, if you know you should repent and continually refuse to do so, A time will come when Christ's sacrifice for sin will no longer be yours. I knew what that meant. No hope. The life of but I leads to condemnation. There is no hope in that life. Suddenly, I no longer wanted the but I life. I didn't even want to see how much sin I could get away with and still make it into heaven. I didn't want a close play as I slid into home, looking up, hoping the umpire would make the call that I wanted him to make. And so I committed myself fully to the but God life. And he changed my direction. He led me in safe paths. He is leading me to heaven. Jesus issues you that same call. To leave behind the but I live life and live for nothing else but God.